All right, a very good morning to all the distinguished delegates who have attended our event today. We are so delighted to have you all here to share your knowledge and insights at the User Testing Executive Roundtable. So on behalf of User Testing and Trescon, we thank you for attending this event today. And that today's discussion will be on amplifying your business by incorporating the voice of customer. And I'm very pleased to introduce to you our esteemed speakers, Millie Gillen, Global Head of Client Experience, MD Standard Chartered, and Rebecca Conwall, Senior Solutions Consultant, User Testing. Today in this virtual discussion, we'll look at how businesses can get deeper insights into customer motivation by using both qualitative and quantitative methods and use them to develop the most effective approaches that best suits your individual organization circumstances. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, let us begin the session and we hope you all have a great one. Over to you, Millie and Rebecca, the stage is all yours. Thank you so much. Hi everyone, I'm so happy to be here. I hope everyone is safe and healthy. I'm really excited about talking to you about some of my experiences and most importantly, hearing about your experiences. Rebecca? Hi everyone, um, I'm Rebecca Cornwall. I'm the Senior Solutions Consultant here at User Testing um, and I cover the Asia Pacific region. Um, I've been with User Testing probably for um, coming up to about eight, nine months now as we've really been ramping up the region and enjoying working with all different types of customers across different industries. It's been a very exciting time and only getting more exciting as the days continue. Um, and prior to my time at user testing, um, I was head of UX at News Corporation. So I have a background in product design and UX and standing up research practice. So yeah, really excited to, uh, to be here with Millie today and with all of you. Um, and I'm excited to see, uh, to hear the conversation that, that ensues. Um, and I'm just gonna hand over now to my colleague, Saurav. Thanks, uh, Rebecca. Thanks, Milly. Um, hi guys, I'm the regional sales director at user testing based here in Singapore. Really looking forward to hearing from uh, our diverse participants from finance, healthcare, uh, retail, and uh, conglomerates. Uh, hoping it will be a great discussion. And if I could request uh, our participants uh, on the Zoom call today to introduce themselves briefly, uh, name, uh, company, and uh, something that you're looking forward to in the session today. Yeah. Uh, can we start with uh, Atul, Atul Sharma? Yeah, sure. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Atul. I'm service uh, and support manager for Pacific Rim countries. I'm based in Singapore. So I work for a diagnostic and life science company. I actually have this. Uh, sorry, this is it Ginnagar? You can see. Or oh, is it better? Yeah, sorry for that. Uh, Atul, please continue. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Okay, so I work for a uh, diagnostic and life science company. So uh, we are in the business for, say, testing for a lot of our blood as well as into biotechnology. So PCR is one of our leading product line at this moment due to the COVID testing. Um, we do have uh, a big um, say customer, voice of customer program running at BioRed Laboratories for where which I work for. Uh, I'm really interested to know what other organizations are doing compared to what we have been doing so far. So looking forward to the conversation with all of you. Awesome, thanks Atul. Uh, Vishnu, I saw, I see you and you just unmuted yourself. So please go ahead. Yeah, hi, hi, my name is Vishnu. I lead uh, customer engagements at uh, Singtel. Uh, on the enterprise side of uh, things. So my role is, at, th at this point of time, I'm doubling down on 5G. 5G as an enabler for you know everything from uh, enhancing customer experience to actually creating newer uh, business models. So my, my interest is actually uh, you know, to learn from this uh, session in you know, what's, what's actually uh, happening uh, within this space. Awesome, uh, great to hear that, uh, Irene. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, as uh, as you all can see, my name is Irene Lim. I'm from the Escort Limited, 
we are uh, one of the largest uh, service apartment hotel company uh, globally, and we are present in many countries. So I, I hit the customer relations uh, team um, sitting under brands and brand and marketing. So we are, I drive the voice of the customer program within the organization, uh, looking at the various channels where our customers are uh, giving us feedback. And we also like to be uh, more proactive in terms of engaging them on these channels as well, because as we all know, uh, customers' feedback is so invaluable in helping us uh, improve our product and services and also looking at what opportunities we can uh, deliver on their customer or their desired customer experience. So I'm here also to learn uh, from each other. Thank you. And hi, Millie. I think I met you before at uh, another session. <laughs> right. Uh, Ayur, Swaminathan. Hey guys, uh, my name is Swaminathan. I work for Viacom CBS. I look after digital for Asia. So my, my role responsibility is primarily looking after AWARD and OTT products in this part of the region. And just joining to learn from others in this session. Awesome. Uh, Priya, Priya Naidu from Zulik. Hi there. Um, I'm Priya. I'm from Zulik Pharma. I uh, look at customer experience for our B2B e-commerce platform. Um, prior to this, I used to work for Standard Chartered um, for the banking as a service capability, um, looking at marketing and insights. Um, and I'm here today to learn um, a little bit more and get to know everybody. Awesome. Great to have you here, Priya. Uh, Saravanan Surendra Kumar. Surendran, sorry. Saravanan Surendran. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, myself, Saravanan Kumar Surendran, and I'm with uh, NCX, uh, looking after uh, the uh, workplace and collaborations, uh, tools and technologies. And obviously uh, so what I would like to learn about is uh, uh, what as a, as a end user will experience when it comes to testing and uh, a voice of the customer. How do we understand them? That's my expected uh, outcome at the end of the session. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, Shamin. Yes, hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Shamin here on Macom for Hartons. We are a real estate agency, one of the largest in Singapore, and we actually serve both the salespersons and also the consumers. So I'm actually excited today to learn from everybody. Thank you. Great to have you here, Shamin. Uh, Caesar Jean Drake, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. No worries. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Caesar. Um, I'm working in Letrolux uh, the, in the regional office here in Singapore. I'm responsible to on the all the technical uh, support for aftermarket sales, and I'm uh, wondering today and I hope to that I can learn uh, more about uh, the the subject that is being exposed and uh, know a little bit about uh, all of you. So thank you. Awesome, um, Santosh Nair. Santosh, do we have you? Hi, uh, my name is Santosh. I work with um, Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. We, I, we can hear you. There's a bit of disturbance, but please go ahead. Hello. Are you able to hear me, see me? Okay. I can hear we Sorry can hear about you. that. I know there's a little bit of an issue with my internet. Okay. Okay, so my name is Santosh Schneider. I work with Siemens. Um, I'm responsible for, for, for digital transformation program um, in the region user experience for our internal users. And we support roughly 235,000 users within Siemens wow. uh, for all IT services. And my role uh, is to look at uh, user experience and one of the aspects of that is voice of customer, uh, which we also collect and use in different ways. But I would love to hear what we do in the external market because I see a lot of members here are working in the external market and voice of customer. We'd love to hear what you do and whether we can adopt some of those practices internally within Siemens as well. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks for that introduction, uh, Santosh. Uh, finally, we have, uh, oh, we have two more. Uh, Neha, Neha Kullar.
Uh, yeah. Hi everyone. Sorry, I was facing some challenges. Uh, good morning. I'm Neha and I work with MRM McCann. I'm a senior manager in customer experience and essentially work closely with consumer brands uh, to build connected consumer journeys. Uh, to align with our UAT as because we awesome. are uh, good to have you back. Or maybe we can have an introduction from you. Okay, uh, Lynn, Lynn Wonk. Hi, yes. Yeah. Sorry, hang on a second, yeah. Sorry, can you, can you guys hear me? Yeah, 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 we can. Okay, so um, hi, I'm Lynn from CYS Global Remit, Private Limited, so uh, Remittance Company. Um, I'm a Chief Marketing Officer. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, Rishi from Roche. Roche. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Rishi. I'm part of the Roche Pharmaceutical Group. Uh, within Roche, uh, I'm part of a group which looks at the global customer experience vertical within Roche, which uh, covers both pharma as well as dia uh, diagnostics. Uh, within that, we look at four capabilities, uh, specifically people-centric competencies, uh, customer journey uh, mapping, as well as customer design, information and insights, as well as digital ecosystems. Uh, so all of those four capabilities are part of our global customer experience program within Roche. So excited to be here and uh, get to understand what other companies in other streams are also looking at customer experience. Awesome, awesome. Great to have you here, Rishi. And I will go to Jeremy now. Jeremy, are you there? Yeah, hi. hi I'm, I'm Jeremy. Uh, I'm from CRS Global Remit. And I'm actually working as a digital marketing officer. Yeah, nice to meet you guys. Nice to meet you too. Um, right. Uh, I I hope I haven't missed anyone. I, I see someone with the name of J S. Uh, is yeah. Hi. Uh, this is Joey Sin here. So I'm from CYS as well. And my in my role over here is is a designer in the company. Awesome. Awesome. Hello. Thank you. Uh, finally, we have Anurag. Anurag from UOB, uh, uh, are you able to hear us? Okay, I, I suppose not. I think we can go. Uh, hey, sorry, sorry. I am in a parallel call. Uh, I am from UOB, yeah, Anurag here. Uh, I will just join you back in five minutes, guys. Sorry. No worries, no worries. Please, please okay. join us back when you are done with your call. Thank you. Right, so uh, thanks everyone for your introductions. We have a great set of uh, audience and I, I hear voice of customer obviously um, and sharing experiences from different industries. So I will hand it over to Millie to now run the session and uh, take us ahead. Fantastic. Um, just before we kick off with a discussion, um, just had a couple of slides just to help frame up the session and get you starting to think about some of those challenges or opportunities that you've seen over the last while. Um, and yeah, to, to reiterate what Sarah picked up on in the introductions, there seems to be just this overwhelming uh, uh, community. So it's really great to hear that everyone has come together to really hear from each other's experiences and, and kind of share as a group. So thanks again. Um, as a user testing, we, we take uh, voice of customer very seriously, as you'd imagine, that is literally the nature of our business. But more than that, it's trying to make sense of the amount of data that we have access to on a day to day basis. And the way we do that is to try and offer that qualitative um, experience of the customer and get that real empathetic voice back into those um, back into the process of creating products and experiences with confidence. And one component of that is obviously doing that with speed and quality in mind. Um, and I thought I'd just frame this um, it, in thinking about the last 18 months and many of the challenges that we faced as businesses. 
Um, it's true to say that there is a couple of key um, businesses and, and industries here that have been pointedly affected by the pandemic. Um, but I think that the number of 97% of executives, that's a huge number, feel that the pandemic speed, um, the pandemic has really sped up their digital transformation. Now, the, the sentiment around that may be positive and negative and maybe some sort of combination of the two, but it's undeniable that it has had a huge impact on the way that we're conducting business and understanding our customers. Um, this is a really great slide just showing like for the negative and positives that have come from this big shift. So some industries have had to really pivot in order to stay afloat and keep going. Um, and others have had to um, pivot and stay afloat from a, from a demand perspective. So whichever side you're on, the one thing is that you can't rest on your laurels and operate in the way maybe you have before. There's a need to change and grow with our customer needs and requirements. And the, tr the one thing that's true more than ever is that we we can't learn our customers and then have this fixed view of them. They are constantly changing um, anyway, but especially when there are large world events, it, that's amplified. And so we're having to unlearn what we think our customers are and then relearn the ways um, that they're, I guess, uh, meeting these challenges that they're facing day to day and how their lives are changing, how their contexts are changing. And ultimately, just to hop back to that first slide, it's all about data at the end of the day. That's how we know how we need to respond to our customers. And we do have a glut of, of quantitative data. We have big data. That doesn't mean to say necessarily that it's easier to make decisions. In fact, sometimes I'm sure many of you will um, agree with and empathize with, and I'm sure we'll get into this in a bit in a, in a moment, is that having lots of data can sometimes make it even harder to make decisions. How do you move forward with, um, with those insights? How do you commit to one over another and start to prioritize? And we really feel, uh, and in the, you know, Tricia Wang um, pertains to this, this idea of thick data. So qualitative data, actually empathizing with customers, understanding the why behind the what. So what's happening, but more importantly, why is it happening? And therefore, how do we respond? Um, and I think it, that's in terms of that kind of tactical approach of how do we stay, how do we stay um, on board with, you know, what the business goals are and how to stay afloat and keep um, prospering in the marketplace. But looking at it from Satya's perspective is, is more than that. It's also enabling innovation that if we're just looking inside of our known environment um, and our known context, we're never going to get the new data or the new insight and empathy to really break out of what's known and create something truly innovative. Um, so, so we thank him for this wonderful quote because it's a really great nudge to remind us of that. So I did promise you it would only be a couple of minutes. Uh, really, we want to get into the chat, and that is about amplifying your business business by incorporating the voice of customer. So without further ado, I shall hand over to the wonderful Millie um, to kick things off. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to see some of familiar faces and then meet new people. Uh, I'm really excited about talking through this because all of us that are focused on customers, the customer experience and the insights, we actually hold the keys to innovation. So I'm really excited about hearing your experiences, learning more. And then I hope maybe since we are a mix of industries that we can co-create together, even just by talking over the next few minutes. So the first question that I, I wanted us to go through is really about uh, empathy. What does empathy mean for you from an organizational standpoint? And the reason why I wanted to start here at empathy is because without empathy, how can we design experiences? How can we ensure that we continue to help our customers or even have customers. So for me, um, when I speak to internally with my colleagues, I say to them, you need to be more empathetic. And it's easy for me to say, go be empathetic. <laughs> but no one really knows what that means. So what I mean is I want you to feel the pain of our customers. And the reason why I want you to feel that pain is so that when you start to feel that pain from the perspective of our customers, then you understand them. And then that also motivates you to go and take action to address those pain points, to address those needs. And I think as we continue down the path of this discussion, we could use the empathy and the knowledge of the needs and the pain points and the pain that we physically feel uh, to go and create innovation or even just start at the basics and optimize our existing, our existing business and solution. So it would be really great to hear from uh, each of you. What does empathy mean for you and your organization? Um, Vishnu, 
I would really love to hear this from you as well. Want to get started? For some reason, wasn't letting me unmute. So I, I think I think you bring up uh, one of the most most key aspects of uh, you know customer experience, which is which is an ability for an organization, especially in a I would say not really in a B two C context, but in a B two B context, the ability to actually empathize with your customer. And uh, since you know, I've spent most of my time in B two B. I think I can largely talk about that. The fact that you know you cannot really uh, determine uh, or rather feel empathy unless you have uh, you know clear data points. And in a B two B environment where you actually form empathy for a company or an account which is represented through numerous individuals. You know, in a, in a company, you're dealing with an operator, a shareholder, a, a treasurer, an a accountant, as well as the CEO. And each one, you know, basically gives you data points. And, uh, you know, if I, if I relate it back to, you know, 5G as a concept, the, one of the slides which was earlier picked up, I think that beautifully explains it. You know, the shift from big data to thick data, the ability to actually capture enough wide data points which allow you to actually build empathy. You see, most of us humans or even systems which behave like humans have an ability to empathize. The problem is the lack of data points, which is sometimes, you know, either uh, because you aren't really, uh, uh, you know, measuring them or you aren't able to perceive them. You know, the sense of perception, it's, it, it depends on your level of sensitivity. It, le it depends on your prejudices, your biases, your, uh, you know, your own, it's, it's more about you if you can't empathize, if you cannot understand the pain. So uh, the only way you could address this is, uh, you know, through more data points and uh, thickening these data points to uh, allow you to have a much broader view and then building, you know, uh, empathy. Uh, as such, I think empathy is such a broad topic. You could, you know, really talk about it for hours together. Yep, definitely. It, it's interesting that you point out from the 5G that we will have this capability that once it becomes wider, uh, broader, that will have the capability to get so many different data points. At the same time, how do we know uh, which data points can help us to be more empathetic and which data points just creates more noise? I think that would be interesting for all of us to go through this journey together mm. and, and figure that out. So uh, Atul, do you have anything to add to that? Especially since it's I think a very different <laughs> industry yeah. on the surface. Yeah, I think it is, it is really a very important aspect of any communication uh, to open up with the customers. And uh, you can't really understand the situation unless you empathize with them, understand what situations they are in or what are the agencies that they are going through to get the work done at their site. So since we work in more in a clinical diagnostic or life science kind of environment, we deal with uh, laboratories a lot and uh, their expectations and the, their environment is completely different than what we are sitting in or our call center uh, team is sitting in. So it is important for, for us to have a little more experience of people in those call centers who have actually worked in those uh, situations and they can understand what that particular operator is going through. He may have to give out the results by the evening or the system has broken down, or they need some application support. So those are the things that you need to understand to really uh, to have that communication established with that particular uh, customer. And then in return, you get a lot of say support, say when we start measuring data points for your NPS, CES or customer satisfaction, you see that start improving. And overall, you see uh, your customer experience needs you to better uh, commercial outcomes. So that's, that's the way I look at it. So it is really, really critical point. I think you have raised a very nice and very critical point for all customer experience. Thank you. Irene, I'm gonna pick on you again. Remember last time, but I think that you could probably give us a crash course over the course of hours, I'm pretty sure, on just empathy, especially since in your industry, you're constantly face-to-face -face and you have to quickly flip the switch and be empathetic. So what have you, what, what pearls of wisdom can you give to us in just a few moments? Okay, um, I think from an individual level, uh, empathy is, is really required, especially those whether you're in a front line or in the heart of uh, home 
uh, you know, um, uh, functions, right? But from an organizational standpoint where you're a bit more removed from uh, interacting directly with the customer, I think that's when uh, it requires a lot more intention and also in the design of how you're able to um, you know, read between the lines and especially from the data that you collect and uh, to be able to put yourself in that empathetic position to understand what customers are really looking for and where are we missing the point or are there opportunities as well. So does that answer your question, Mili? I think that's the, the challenge. Yeah. Mm. Absolutely. Uh, Irene, can I ask you something? You know, okay, who's uh, that speaking? This is Vishnu here. I, okay. I spoke earlier. So I wanted to ask you, in your industry specifically, you see the whole industry is now moving towards automation where you have human robots, you know, and, uh, and, and a lot of other automation capabilities which are, which are interacting, right? They've become interactive in nature. Do you think that there is a lack of, you know, empathy because we are moving towards an era of automation where uh, empathy is an extra sensory, uh, you know, uh, uh, ability to understand what could be going on in a person's mind. It's not always about data points. So do you yeah. think that's something that's impacting your industry due to automation itself? Um, we are using automation in um, certain areas, like for example, in some of the properties in China, you know, because there's, uh, there's this huge online shopping and everything is about delivery. So that does take up our already limited resources in terms of staffing to do all these delivery sort of work. So if that is something that uh, can be automated and by using robots, for example, uh, that is something that we have already done, but it doesn't quite um, remove the, the uh, you know, opportunity for our staff to interact with our guests, right? Uh, you know, so if there's, there's still a concern or whatsoever, the guests can still reach out to our staff. But the robots are there just to perform a function, right? And I, I suppose in this day and age, it's still quite novel, you know, to have a cute robot appearing in your door. Uh, so I think customers are still pretty much delighted about that. But I think when it comes to a point where that becomes the norm, and then I think customers, uh, we might be ready in a space whereby uh, we'll move on to the next level of, you know, even um, having customers craving for a human contact point. Because we're still social that beings at the, the end of the day. Premium yeah. service. Uh, uh, yes, know, exactly. In, yes. Interact with a human. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Maybe, that's, that's something that I was already thinking about. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. maybe can I add something here? Uh, I think uh, when we design uh, the process to be effortless to consumer in the robotic, uh, using robotic and automation, I think this is we can bring empathy on that. The problem is when we, and a lot of companies are moving on this direction, they're just putting automation and putting robotic and turn it harder to consumers get interaction, get to, mm. to go to the point that they're looking for. So I give you a very simple example. I'm not going to mention the brand. Uh, just uh, I received a call that was a very humanized, uh, uh, I think, way of treating me that I didn't perceive in the first time that it was a robot talking to me that is scheduled my, uh, my topic and so on, even that I was not expecting that. And it was in a way when I put questions, like uh, answering what I expecting on that. So I think that's the challenge is to like, uh, uh, still understand the consumer and design for that. You can put mm. automation, but need to, to understand the consumer at all. Yes, correct. If I am I'm reminded of something here, you know, one of the, one of the companies which excels in this is Apple. It's, it's, it's got, you know, it's, it's field agents, people in the stores. And I was always wondering in my mind, how does it happen? So recently, you know, Apple added me to their business excellence program, as they call it. So they have an app through which, you know, everybody who works uh, and sells Apple products, you know, uh, takes training as well as has to. And I was, I was amazed with what they have. They actually have a conversation simulator wherein, you know, a, a guy has walked into the store. What are you going to talk to him about? You know, how are you going to navigate the conversation? How do you, they actually put it in action wherein they allow you to create your framework for empathy and, you know, be able to relate to customer needs and driving conversation. It's not about sale. It's about making that customer's experience good. And now, you know, in my mind, I'm seeing that there is actually an element of training, you know, from an empathy perspective, which, which is probably missing. We're always talking about judging it based on, you know, BAU, but there's also a lot of training which has to be done to, uh, you know, basically equip people into being able to become better agents, you know, for their uh, customers. 
Um, so I am so jealous. You don't need to, to brag to all of us how you get this special access. I'm really jealous. I wish no, I it's a part access. of the Singtel's deal. In fact, I got a free <laughs> iPhone 12 as well as a part of it. So <laughs> Okay, <laughs> Vishnu, I'm uh, jealous even more so. <laughs> um, uh, but Lily, I, can I actually I, bring up... Yeah. Can I just add something? This is Santosh here. And uh, to what Vishnu said, and now uh, let me add on it from a perspective of a customer of Apple. And, uh, and I think... What Vishnu alluded to is so true on the experience that you create with a customer. And personally, I've been uh, using the Apple products for a very long time and I've interacted with a few of the agents because the product is uh, good, didn't really have too many issues, but whenever I had issues, the way they deal with you and the amount, and you know, the why, why I wanted to bring it up, we talked about call centers, we talked about help agents, et cetera. Most of the call centers and agents are given a target to, uh, you know, quickly call, finish the call. There is an average handling time, and then there is a resolution time, and then you hop the customer over to multiple steps if you can't solve the problem, and then the next level of expertise and the next level of expertise kicks in. Right? It does frustrate you as a customer. But what I experienced was. When I had a problem with a device that was definitely out of warranty because it was a nine-year-old Mac and it stopped working, I had agents from uh, Apple sitting with me for over four and a half hours to fix it. Now, obviously, they didn't spend the time. It's the total elapsed time of four and a half hours. But they made sure of a couple of things. Number one is... They left me at a, they were with me until a point where they knew and I knew and I was comfortable that, okay, now I can do these few steps on my own. And then they made sure they called back at the time they said they will call back and then continued their journey until I resolved the problem, right? I'm out of warranty. I'm not paying a dime to them for the support and they supported me through it. Now, if this is not empathy, what is, right? Because on the other hand, I've had experiences Unfortunately, I also run, uh, and, you know, well, I don't run the call center, but, you know, I have a contract with somebody who runs a call center and our KPIs towards them actually is not the right KPIs because we exactly manage what's your average handling time, how do you bring down the time of handling customers and calls, etc. right? And there is a lot of data that is generated and we evaluate. What we really miss out is handling the emotion and that conversation with the, with the customer and to me, I am now a full 100% fan. My entire family is an Apple family now. We are all I think, around. Santosh, you know, it, it sort of alludes to what's your starting position with a customer. Are you starting with he's right and let me try to prove him wrong, you know, through by asking questions? Or is the, is the starting position that, you know, this guy doesn't know it, he's wrong. Now let me try to see where he may be right, you know? So that's uh, what's your starting position. I think that uh, you, you establish your empathy through your starting position. Whether it's That's an interesting Apple. customer insight, actually, Vishnu. And I think that brings us to our, our next topic. But actually, before we move on to the next topic, I know that um, I think it's Rishi. He has a question or he wants to make a comment. I think mainly uh, just one thought in here. I think uh, from a pharmaceutical industry, uh, we really looked at uh, how we define empathy, and we spend quite a bit of time on it. I think uh, traditionally pharmaceutical industries have a view that we treat patients as patients, right, very functionally. Uh, and that was a feedback that we were getting. But we tried to sort of get into the shoe of the patients and really started defining how would a patient feel uh, in terms of being treated um, and he wants uh, he or she wants to be treated like a normal human being at the end of the day and that's where we took back some of these insights and tried to uh, say layer it up in three or four aspects uh, where we tried to sort of work around so one was to understand the the implicit and the explicit needs uh, and whether they are being listened to right uh, all so some aspects around patient journey were uh, imperative to be considered throughout the relationship. So we made sure that we go back to the patient journey, started identifying pain points, prioritizing these pain points, and also making sure some of the needs that are being generated are treated as if that they were there our own, right? And not just as an enterprise, but really being in the patient's shoes when uh, 
acting upon their needs. So I think some bit of insights around patient journey becomes really critical of what we have seen on implementing some of these aspects related to empathy, uh, which are really relationship driven. Great, thank you so much. And actually, I think that brings us to our next topic. Um, so what are some of the barriers to truly understand voice of the customer? And what are some of the ways to work through those challenges? So I don't know about you, but I, one of the biggest barrier, one of the biggest challenge for me is looking at MPS, looking at surveys, looking at complaints, and not really getting what is the root cause here? And what, what is the customer trying to do? What is the true pain point? And how can we move upstream to go and address it rather than, okay, let me respond to this specific case, but in, in being more uh, proactive rather than reactive. So, and I am happy to talk about, you know, some of the things that we have started to do and implement and seen some success around how to uh, overcome some of these challenges. But really first, I'd actually love to hear from uh, Swami Nathan to see, you know, what, what you might have to add, especially since your industry is, is pretty drastically different from most of the others that are on here. No, for us, the voice of the customer voice of the customer is two pronged right? One is the customer that actually is a B2B customer who actually distributes our content. And actually the other voice of the customer is the end consumer who consumes our content. And I think both of us, both of them are important for us from uh, that perspective. We work with the likes of Centel, we work with the likes of Starhub. And also we work with the, and ultimately the content which we produce is also consumed by consumers like kids, which is Nickelodeon, which is our biggest brand on it. So what we do is as a company, we do have every year a regular research that happens across all the markets we cover we try and understand what the customers are looking for what the trends are even kids as a genre right it's changed a lot like my kids i call them the tablet kids right they're born with the tablet in their hand they know what to use it and they're far more comfortable even with the home-based learning to use a tablet than actually a pc or a computer so this is the voice of that so if we know that kind of a behavior of the consumer we also know what how the content what the emotions are because when you're producing content, a lot of emotions come out of the content and stuff like that. So we use that a lot. And actually that shapes and defines what we produce, how we produce, and what's going to be the delivery mechanism for it. Great, thank you. Priya, anything to add? Yep, hi. Um, I think for us as well, um, you know, we've got many different layers of, uh, you know, who we would consider our customers. So we've got our clients, um, our end users, and then our doctor's offices, uh, pharmacies, etc. So um, I think getting taking in all of those uh, viewpoints, um, and then there's also maybe some conflicting information between those three customer groups, and how we manage that and balance that, I think is uh, something that's interesting for us, uh, you know, to, to figure out. Um, but, uh, you know, this is uh, really the foundation for us uh, to understand our customers is, uh, you, you know, the, C the NPS scores and the feedback that we're getting uh, from them. So we review that uh, on a regular basis. Um, but I think the challenge, again, is making sure that we can kind of uh, gather all that data um, and, uh, you know, figure out how those conflicting messaging uh, you know what we do with that great thank you that's pretty insightful so, uh, so Millie, you know, I, I wanted to ask you something when you say a voice of the customer you're assuming who your customer is what about it's you know you can you can you can target a majority of people who have talked to you who have consumed but there is a there is the whole you know the the, the outside of the venn diagram or the, the universal set that hasn't spoken to you is a probable possible customer, somebody who's turned off, gone away, doesn't care. So, you know, I think it's it's not so much about those who consume your services, but about those who you don't even know about. So, uh, and, and again, is it the voice of the customer or the feeling and the mind of the customer that you want to uh, capture that would actually help you take actionable, uh, you know, outcomes towards enhancing the experience? Yeah, I could mm. not agree with I, you more. And actually, I... Um, Sorry, Irene, just one moment. Okay. Uh, one, one thing that we do is we don't just look at our customers through you know, NPS and complaints, but what we also do from a voice of the customer perspective is look at three different categories. One is who are our current customers, obviously. Who are our customers that we should be going after, but we don't, uh, as well as those customers, and I think this is probably most important, those customers we can never convince. 
and that will never be our customers. So we know where not to invest our time, our resources, our, our money, our funds, and building solutions for them. Um, Irene, really quickly, back to you. Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to add on to that uh, point that you were saying as well, and also to Vishnu. I mean, there's this group of customers that have not used our brands or our products. So I think it will still be... Um, I think the challenge is how do we reach them to understand, you know, are we not serving your needs or are we not, uh, why, why you haven't used our product? So I think that's an important segment and that's definitely a challenge because apart from using uh, market research firms to do like on the street kind of survey, because, but that can get very expensive, right? Um, so that, that can also cause a barrier to um, understanding that segment of customers. But coming back to the customers that are using our product. So obviously there's, um, a different level of customers as well. But I think the challenge is really, uh, you know, getting the right questions. Are we asking the right questions at the right place, uh, right point in time? Uh, you know, the same customers are also customers of other businesses and they are also being bombarded by many other surveys, uh, you know, other uh, channels. They are also asking for their share of feedback. So I'm sure, you know, you yourself um, and many here in the, in the, in the, web, uh, in the space right now, you know, we're probably getting <laughs> a service of all sorts. So uh, sometimes we are, we are losing them as well because uh, we, are, we, are, we are experiencing high competition in also in this space. So I have a point, point here. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, so just like to add a couple of things here. See, the voice of customer, the biggest that, you know, the, the challenge, what I personally feel, is, especially in the larger organizations where you have uh, too many touch points for the customers, the customers can go to you know anyone to raise their concern or to ask for services and all. The biggest challenge comes is a mindset. So that's what I feel that you know people in bigger organization they follow the process, but at times besides the process, I think you know uh, when customer is coming to you, reaching out to you, little bit of you know the hy hypothesis that you need to build that what could be the situation and how that could be dealt beyond that you know the process. It differs from market to market. Certain markets are very, very, you know, uh, the emotional summer, certain markets are very rational. So in my experience, I have been into the shoes where, you know, dealt with B2C and B2B. The landscape of understanding and, you know, the landscape, landscape of managing customers' requests is very, very different in these two places. Now, again, why I'm talking about the, you know, uh, the bigger organization, bigger organization, the processes, for example, let's say those are spread it all across the region, all across the world. And at times, that differs also. And that's where that, you know, the critical piece comes that we don't really, although everyone says, okay, we need to understand, we need to share knowledge from one region to another, but that practically doesn't happen much. So that's where another, you know, the pitfall that we don't learn really that what's happening in the other market and how we can from one market, which is completely different, which is emotional to ration, how, how can we bring that aspect in that market? And we try to solve that problem in most of the time, firefighting situation. Now, the other thing is that the point, very good point was brought in that, okay, the customer voice is not always your customer. The customer voice is all your potential customers, whether they are on board or not. Nowadays, I think we have a tool because last time, I mean, you know, customer would stay, you know, keep their, uh, whatever that, you know, the, the feelings about a one particular brand within themselves. But nowadays, the social media, actually the people go and talk about one company, one experience to one product to another product. So I think that is one of the good way actually that you know, organizations should start tapping from the customer experience perspective. Now organizations looking at data more for sales, right? But not really looking looking at from the customer experience. So yeah, so that's that's uh, uh, my thought on this. Great point. Thank you so much for adding that. I see uh, we're now moving on to our next question. Uh, more data can mean more questions. Can you share your experience of making sense of that data and that insight? I'm actually really interested in hearing from Saravana Kumar, uh, only because I I take the I make the assumption that you're probably constantly surrounded by tons of data points, uh, and um, I'm also interested in hearing from a few others. Yeah, so uh, the 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 more data you collect, the more accurate your uh, uh, response is going to be. Right, that's what it means to. So in terms of uh, collecting the data, obviously it gives you more insights on what are the action items that you should take. 
to to broadly classify on which one like the low hanging fruits can cause a big impact in terms of uh, the issues that are being faced by customers yeah that's about it thanks for that uh, arun from mastercard i know you didn't have a chance earlier today or earlier in this call to um, introduce yourself sorry was I, I was the here. i was the one talking previous to uh oh, the sorry last about that. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, no worries. Sorry. No worries. Um, okay, so, so actually, uh, Arun, I noticed that I noticed that you come from Mastercard, and my alma mater. So I have I have a lot of uh, that's really top of my heart. Uh, and I know that you're from uh, the loyalty team, and you have tons and tons of data to access. Absolutely. So I, I would really love to hear from you on your perspective, and I'm pretty sure all of us can learn. See, uh, data is uh, is an insight, and I would say not allow you, but forces you to infer things and forces you to take the right actions. Okay, so data is, I mean, in you know, the customer journey is very, very critical, very critical. You wouldn't know, I'm just giving an example. When we work with the banks and you try to create a loyalty program and create a customer complete digital journey and bring their all products on the digital first kind of mode, you wouldn't know that, okay, when the customer starts, which click, the customer is actually dropping, which customer is actually proceeding further and how long that takes time. So these are the basic data points. I mean, I'm just explaining, uh, sharing this example because I think everyone will understand this. So you would know that which customer actually, you know, are dropping and which customer is continuing. And this is the data you can define, redefine, define and again, redefine your customer journey. So data is not only about that. Again, it's not only about the data what you have. I think it's equally important the data what you don't have and what you don't see. Again, you know, the, to, uh, to understand again the customer's, uh, you know, uh, the experience journey and what exactly they want, what changes they want. There's a lot of iteration that has to go through and every step of this. And data what you can absorb from outside, like not within your organization, that is equally important. Today. And to my mind, I think uh, uh, data, if you ask me, especially in the financial, and I'm not talking about the only MasterCard, but even if you talk about the banks and all, it's the most critical piece right now because you have a large customer base. So if you look at the MasterCard, right? So MasterCard, although we do B2B business, but we really need to consider you know, that our end users as well. And when we talk about the end users, it's millions, millions of users, right? So how do we bring that insight from, again, other market and other places and create a one holistic experience in different ways? So data is definitely the key. Thank you so much for, for educating us on that. Uh, Paraksha, I don't think that you had the opportunity yet to introduce yourself, but I am interested in hearing, especially from your industry, how do you go about this? Prakash, I think. Thanks, sorry. Prakash? Yeah, we haven't heard from Prakash and Darren uh, who joined us later. Uh, Darren, are you there? Uh, yes, I just got in. Sorry. Um, no worries. So we can uh, do a quick introduction and uh, help share. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Sure. Um, my name is Darren Howe. I run the uh, customer experience function for Singapore Pools. Um, the um, question that is posed is a very, very apt one because this is a day to day um, issue that we are facing. Um, we are we have started collecting data um, for uh, the past couple of months and um, it has come to a point where data, data is getting um, uh, not manageable. So far, we have relied on manual um, sieving of the data. We are still exploring some um, AI capabilities where it allows us to look at uh, repeat um, sentiments from our customers so that we can focus on only the um, new ones. Um, the challenge right now is um, how to look at uh, the extra and the uh, um, additional comments that come in um, that points to other pain points that we have not already, uh, that's not already made known to us. So this is the current situation we are, we are having. Darren, I think you're a mind reader. You helped us to start, kickstart the conversation on the next question. So but I, but I, must, I must point something, Willie, about Darren. When you're in an industry where 
your focus is not to actually get more customers into consuming your products given that you know uh, some industries are qualified as uh, you know uh, not, not not really uh, you know uh, on, on the other side of the moral radar like gambling as well as uh, you know probably uh, uh, alcohol cigarettes etc how how difficult it is for them you know where there's a mandate on actually making the customer experience a little less smooth so that you know you're not really enabling but at the same time you do want to deliver a good customer experience it's 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 ironical that they have to really go through that that's such uh, yes, a very you're right. and, and point. yeah yes you're right but i'm um, not forgetting that we do have a lot of unseen competitors out there who are operating in the illegal markets so at least uh, our uh, focus is not to make the experience as bad as uh, um, it, it, it is compared mm. to the illegal operators, yes. Wow, that's a really great balance that you have to constantly play uh, to not be too, to not motivate too much, but at the same time, don't, don't be that bad. Yeah, toughest job. <laughs> that's a really world. great, it's a really great uh, insight. I give a lot of credit to you. Uh, Prakash, I think you have your hand up. Yeah. Yes, I think I had some, hello everyone, sorry, I had some difficulty in my network, I was not able to argue, uh, sorry for being late, and can you, can you all hear me well? Yes. Okay, um, I mean, I was just look, looking at the question, what was asked before the data and uh, inside to data, I think, I think they, Data is very important today. I, I come from an industry where we are the customers, we we are the complete to B2B and B2C, but our end users are completely different. We are uh, catering to scientific customers or the scientists or the student is. And at this point in time, I'm data for us uh, where the customers are giving insight and customers are the journey which we started a couple of years back we 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 take a lot of experience and we are actually utilizing that data a lot because this data gives us a lot of sense in terms of you know how you retain customer how long uh, uh, a customer how is not that experience for a customer who want to come to you again and again and again and again because we are not into a direct customer where you are yeah we are into mobile phone but for us it's different but the data for us is very important today from a collection perspective and also making meaningful insight out of it That's a really great point. Collecting all the data, that's a big issue, but then also to turn that into meaningful insights. And I actually think that that takes us to our next question. Um, so how do you prioritize which insights to take action on and uh, when when making business decisions and why? So uh, Shermaine, it would be great to hear from you. Hi, everybody. Okay, I think... Um... On this note, right, we actually look at, because uh, our business is slightly more complicated, we don't just uh, look into what our clients need. Um, it's actually more towards what our agents need and what their clients need. Yeah, so there's actually a few levels that we need to uh, interpret uh, when we look at the different data. So it could be uh, on our salesperson end when we want to do recruitment, this is a set of uh, data to look at and if we are looking to grow for instance our salespersons uh, who are maybe 30 to 35 uh, then this is the action this is the insights that we look into to make our decisions and if it's for our clients to a for our salespersons to help them to grow their sales then we need to look at which segment of the clients are they serving is it the luxurious uh, clients or is it um, more of the general public like us before we actually decide, decide how we can help them better. Yeah, thank you. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you so much. Um, Jeremy, did you have anything to add?
actually, um, so while we're waiting to hear from Jeremy, Neha, I think this would be really interesting for all of us to learn from you, especially since you come from, um, you, you can see the end to end in, this, in the respect of identifying who the customers are, getting their, their feedback, their insights, and then helping to figure out which insights to prioritize, making those business decisions, and then actioning them into, into your initiatives. So it'll be really interesting to hear from you. If I, if I just may add to this, I think uh, the insight into the data for business decision is really a important factor uh, when it is coming from a customer. And we, we look at uh, say responses which are coming directly from the distractors. So we, we take them very seriously and uh, we make sure that uh, say one of our the managers do get in touch with that particular customer and make sure uh, understand what is causing that dissatisfaction and how we can incorporate that into our into our priorities or in our business plan uh, to fill up those gaps. So that's that's the most critical for us, and especially in our business. Thank you, Atul. Um, I one other thing I wanted to point out for this question is. I think that there is a big trend for everyone trying to figure out what is the next NPS. And what I have found is return on experience or ROX, that actually helps us to prioritize which insights to, to follow, which insights to uh, go and invest in. So what we do is we take a lot of insights, not just only from the voice of customers, but also from many other voices, promise not schizophrenic voices, uh, and really just focus on you know, what are the most uh, important and instrumental uh, experiences that a customer prioritizes, and then marrying that to our business financials, so revenue expenses, and, and then prioritizing which one should be at the top of our backlog. When I say business financials, I'm talking about if we focus on these prioritized experiences that the customer is telling us this is the most important for you to, to win me as a customer or keep me as a customer, uh, then then what does that mean in terms of, is it going to be extremely expensive for us to invest in? How much more incremental revenue will we uh, uh, make or generate if we focus on this? As opposed to uh, in prioritization meetings, I don't know about you, but sometimes I hear that those that get prioritized are the ones from the people who scream the loudest. So hopefully the customers will scream the loudest here. Any uh, insight on that? Um, let's hear from Lynn. I think Lynn has uh, dropped off. Thank you. Uh, Anurag, if you're still around, it'd be great to hear from you, Anurag, if you're able to rejoin us from your other call. <laughs> Otherwise, we, we can. Yeah, just leave we can it open. We can move on to the next. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we can either we can move on to the next one, and then if anybody has other thoughts, please feel free to put it in the chat. So based on recent outcomes, excuse me, based on recent times, how have your customers' expectations and actions shifted? And how did you come to that conclusion? So one thing that I can say is the obvious, you know, the pandemic, that's definitely shifted my customers' expectations, me as a customer, and then also some of the actions that we've taken. Last year, my team and I, we spearheaded this, this initiative called Signature Actions. What could we do for our customers across the regions, across the countries? as COVID was starting to, to take over in their lives. And moving away from, hey, here's another product you can buy. Here, go and take out a loan. Oh, we can refinance your loan. How can we make more money off of you? Moving from that to, what do you need to stay alive? What do you need to stay sane? How can we help you? And this is how we really shifted our business from numbers oriented to more empathy. Of course, numbers are still important, but at the same time, being human, that is the most important. And I think just for sanity's sake, that was important for all of us to feel like we were doing something to help. Uh, and then the other aspect on a more data related versus a emotional related. So I, I definitely took a, a bigger look uh, on trends. What are trends and how do you even find them? 
So everywhere around us are signals and some of the signals are louder than others. And those louder signals turn into trends. And I pay attention to those trends so that it can help me to figure out how are our customers, their expectations are shifting. How should we be shifting our um, actions and our solutions so that we can start to anticipate some of these trends. For example, one trend before the pandemic, during the pandemic, and I'm pretty sure for quite a while after the pandemic is betterment. How do we make our customers better? So typically customers, doesn't matter what age range, doesn't matter what their social economic class may be, they all typically customers gravitate towards brands that try to help make them better, better themselves, educate them, uh, help them to become better global citizens of the world. For example, if they have an interest in sustainability or climate change, how do we help make them better? So those are the types of trends that we pay attention to. And I'm curious to hear from others. And this is an open um, question for everyone to, to feel free to jump in. Curious about others, how do you keep an ear to the ground, if you will, uh, to understand the customer's expectations? Maybe that's trends or maybe that's talking to your customers. And then how do we or you uh, utilize that and incorporate it into your businesses, into actions and experiences? I think, you know, probably I can start off with the pandemic leading to a change in the connectivity expectations of people, you know, in the in the past, people would look at, hey, you know, among all the operators who can give me the best plan, that used to be a very clear expectation. Uh, of course, there's an element of expectation around, you know, how do I pay for it? What's the, how do I get my handset, et cetera, et cetera. And even from a business perspective, how do they make it easier for the employees to get onto a, you know, connectivity plan also, you know, or maybe their hosting, et cetera. But what the pandemic has done is that it's, it's, it's suddenly made people realize that in the Maslow's, you know, hierarchy, connectivity has now become a part of it that you know one of your one it's it's become a core need of your day-to-day -day, uh, you know job as well as life so now we have customers who say that okay you know i know another operator gives us a cheaper plan but if it's going to go off even for five minutes i'm dead so you know i can't i can't i can't figure that can you give me extreme reliability and that's also becoming a reason why 5g is gaining uh, ground can you can you actually help me do things not just at home when i'm on my fiber but also outside you know probably on my run can i take a you know call while i'm out playing tennis you know 15 minutes i get in between so the way people are the the way people are working has changed that has completely changed their connectivity requirements and and uh, unless telcos or you know companies like us actually have our ears to the ground and are listening to them we would not be able to improve the, you know, the services or even match up, you know, what they have. So it's a, it's a very, very fast evolving world where expectations have rapidly uh, changed and, uh, and it's on us to actually meet those expectations or be, uh, you know, uh, uh, or be, uh, you know, uh, removed from the customer's mindset. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm looking at the time and just in the interest of everyone's diary, let's hear from one more person, but if you have other other uh, great insightful points to add, please feel free to do so in the chat. I just want to add here. Sorry, just a... Sorry. Sorry, sorry, go ahead. Okay, I just wanted to add here because of pandemic, uh, we do see a lot of those customers who are uh, not very close to us. Um, in terms of distances, they have, they have started to accept um, the remote support and remote diagnostics as one of the services. So we are incorporating it into more into our product offering so that so those customers are better supported. Uh, we are introducing some of the more product that we can utilize to get connected and provide solution to those customers even uh, when we can't really reach them quickly or there is uh, country to country travel is not possible or training and support is not possible. So that's another big area which is opening as it is for, for us to be able to train our channel partners as a remote support rather than um, be there in front of those machines and training them one to one. Great, thank you so much. Uh, I'll hand it back over to Rebecca to take any questions. Thank I you. think Arun, yeah, Arun also had a point. Arun, please uh, feel free to share what you want. Uh, 
so yeah, I'll just keep it very short and maybe just try to put a few lines only. Okay, so uh, the customer uh, in the current situation, I think the customer is definitely the end user, but again, I'm going to bring the point about B2B. Now there's a lot of customer, including big like banks and as well as the small merchants. They've got a huge impact because of this COVID situation, right? The banks complete, you know, the revenue model and their profitability model has changed. So they were a rely, bit of reliance on that, you know, cross-border spend, shopping and all. So that had come down substantially and all we all know that. Now the bank had a problem that how do they, how do they diversify the customers, you know, the engagement from cross-border to any other category of spend? How do they create in time the customer experience, which is digital? Because uh, earlier before COVID situation, nobody took, you know, nobody could understood that, okay, that situation would be so severe and they need to really take uh, that, you know, action in a quick manner. So as an organization, MasterCard, I think that becomes our core job in the last one and a half year, that how do we enable you know, our banks to actually diversify their revenue, diversify to a different thing, and making sure that the end users is not only uh, uh, you know, continue to engage, but brings the profitable to bank. And the same approach that we were you know, uh, trying to work with merchants as well. That's a wonderful closing thought to that um, to that prompt because it's I think it really ties back very nicely into that innovation piece, which is that yes, we we have these uh, front of you know these problems right in front of us that we solve for, but through empathy, it doesn't mean to say that we can't take it one step further and create something that doesn't just fix the immediate problem, but actually makes a better solution for everyone in the long term in ways that we didn't previously know. So it's kind of making it's that transformation, isn't it? Making those big leaps towards something better for everyone. Um, thank you so much uh, to Millie for moderating that session and to all of you for your for your heartfelt contribution. I have, um, it, uh, yeah, Rebecca, I think I can summarize some of the points in today's discussion uh, that were brought up by the team. Uh, I think some really great uh, insights, uh, like uh, the challenges in VOC really depend on which customer they are talking to, whether it's B2B, B2C. Uh, there are many layers of customers for people to deal with and they want to understand how they can engage each of them better without spending too much money. And I think uh, uh, one of the points on VOC was that there are too many touch points which makes running these programs extremely complex. Uh, and yes, I mean, uh, a great point was brought up that customer voice is not just existing customers, but all the customers who could potentially buy their services. And of course, around data, we discussed that, you know, there are there is a lot of data, there are a lot of insights to be gathered um, and prioritizing insights is a challenge uh, and, and deciding which data to prioritize at. And people are looking at different kinds of levels of data. They're looking at different profiles. They are segmenting. Uh, and COVID has definitely changed behaviors tremendously for our participants. Customer behaviors have changed uh, right from moving on to new communication modes to uh, uh, having uh, requirements of you know, changing how they bank and you know, models changing for customers. So I thought I would just summarize some of the key points that we discussed today. And uh, our participants, feel free to add any open thoughts you may have at this stage uh, before we close off the discussion. Okay, we can close then. Okay, so basically, um, we, we have, still have a little bit of time. So for anyone that would love to stay um, with us for the next five, 10 minutes, we've got a really beautiful case study uh, with AAA Insurance um, out of our US office, uh, one of our customers there. Um, and it gives a really good insight into the ways that we work with different organizations um, to help them um, with their qualitative insights and how to have that human empathy in every touch point of everything that they do to really kind of balance out, you know, the, the, that um, quantitative data point. Um, but also before we get to that, it would be really great that if anyone is interested to have a, a complimentary consultation with us, we would love to hear more about what you're doing as a business and how we might help you get to that voice of customer and really get to that um, point of empathy. So please do reach out to Harris, Harris Tan, uh, htan at usertesting.com and he, he would love to be able to schedule some time for us to walk through a little bit more about what we do as an organization and um, but also to find out more about you and how we may be able to work together. Um, so yet again, 
thank you so much for being part of this wonderful community. It is really a really heartfelt thing for us to see so many, you know, high profile individuals in your respective industries um, that have taken the time to come out and share and learn together. Um, it's and it really is with, you know, with the customer in mind. So it's really, really kind of heartwarming to see and to hear and, and it's obviously super interesting to us as well to get such a diversity of insight. Um, so thank you so much. Um, and yeah, please do get in contact. And please do stay back if you'd like to see the case study. I think yeah, we can we can play the case study, uh, Rebecca. Let's yeah. yeah. Um, okay, here we go. So basically, this is um, the Triple A Club Alliance. Um, they went through a process AAA. of optimizing their website for um, for many different goals, but ultimately, ultimately, so that they could um, improve their, their web conversions and also their top tier memberships and um, obviously revenue. And the results were quite dramatic. They had a thirty percent lift in web conversion, a fifty five percent lift in top tier memberships, and a thirty nine lift in total revenue. Um, and one of the really early compelling ways that they did that was to remove some 90% of content from their homepage that was actually obscuring the information um, that customers really needed and wanted. Um, so I won't talk too much about it. I'll let the video speak for itself. So uh, please enjoy. LA has been around for 118 years. We're about 6.3 million members. We cover 13 different states. We are there to help people when they need us most at the side of the road. And that's our core. Over time, we've added products and services that are really truly designed to save our members time and or money. AAA is a complex business ecosystem. We have a lot of products to offer. How do we begin the conversation? How do we get them in the door? That was the sort of thing that we wanted to focus on. One of the biggest challenges, how do we start really thinking of our members as a precious resource that we need to manage the frequency of communication, the content of that communication, so that we understand them better, understand their needs better. Being a bit of an enabler, trying to clear roadblocks, create paths and empower people to win and learn, who's gonna benefit? Our members. I looked at user testing when I first found out about it as this just felt like a force multiplier for us. We can airdrop this into any part of our existing member process in real time, get feedback and react, and it fit perfectly into what Agile meant. The results far exceeded our expectations. The single homepage project we used as our initial test had a 30% lift to conversions and also moved members to a higher tier tier conversions. And we're seeing double digit positive trajectory, whether that's in decreasing some negative aspect of our user experience or obviously driving incremental percentage change in our growth. It's all huge. My favorite thing about user testing is the ability to combat the assumptions that a lot of organizations carry. There are many things that I've seen come up that have been legacy assumptions about the marketplace, about our customers, about their perceptions of who we are and what we offer that may or may not be true. And the ability to go into the market quickly, get answers to those, validate or invalidate things is a meaningful contribution to our bottom line. We are in a constant champion challenger A-B testing environment, and I'm never going to step away from it. You know, we've crossed over this divide now, and the only thing we can ever do is continue to evolve. The biggest piece of having user testing at our fingertips is to make a cultural shift in what people were doing. It's giving the folks a tool that allows them to iterate and innovate faster. That's going to lead to the increase in revenue, efficiencies, decreasing costs, and we're seeing all of those as a result. It empowers our teams to test. By building empathy for your customers, understanding the challenges that they face, you're able to build a more meaningful relationship. One thing I'd say user testing represents is a new paradigm in business development. Quite simply, user testing is the most potent weapon in our arsenal. User testing has allowed us to grow, innovate, and test. It showed us the results that really meant something. Uh, for those of us who are still uh, with us, we will reach out to you. And uh, if this interests you, maybe show how you can really create empathy in the modern world where it's not always easy to find new customers, talk to them and, and, and hear from them uh, in a qualitative manner. So yeah, uh, Arun, Jeremy, uh, Atul, and uh, uh, I don't think we have anyone else here. Yeah, would love to come back to you and Irene, uh, if you guys are all right. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. Thanks, everyone. Thank Good session. Thank you all.